So today's lecture is very much um, focused on calculations. Um, there, we're going to introduce an idea, but um, it's not that much different from what we talked about last week, so I'm just filming the whole thing in our um, downward calculation mode. So we're quickly going to look at types of forces, and then I'm going to talk you through beam versus truss. So why we can use method of sections for beams the same way we could for trusses, even though we're looking at something different. And then I'm just going to remind you about analogous point loads or analogous loads or how, how we represent something as a center of mass. And then we're going to go on to kind of the good stuff. I also, looks like I need to change my mouse setting here for you guys. Just give me a second. Okay, that's better. Um, and so I'll show you how we calculate these things. And normally, um, for your exam, even, you'd have to go through and do the worked out calculations. Um, sorry, I'm also eating pretzels. Um, I'm, also, I'm going to show you a way to cheat, essentially. It's not really cheating because it is what engineers do all the time. We have to know how to go back and do this from basics, but I'm going to show you a way we can look up a lot of the stuff we're talking about today. On the exam, I obviously can't stop you from doing it that way, but for your project, for part two of your project, you have to do method of sections. This has to be tested. It is mandated to me that I test you on this. So. Your project has to be method of sections. The exam normally has a component that is method of sections, but obviously with it being on Quercus, I can't really do that anymore. Okay, so let's, let's just remind ourselves. Um, forces that act internally on an object that cause no movement of the object in space, but cause, cause distortion. So we had our objects that had external loads, whether it was a moment or a force, that caused it not to move in space. But we know that that meant that there were internal forces happening on that thing. And so there can be distortion, it can bend, it can squash, it can stretch, but it wasn't moving around in space. Those were distortions of the object. So typically, uh, they are typically pairs of forces or pairs of moments, which include an applied force and a reaction to hold it in equilibrium. Internal forces are represented by axial forces, so that can be compression or tension. Shear, which is that act of things kind of moving relative to each, moving relative to each other along a plane, and bending. We also had torsion, which we're not really talking about much in this course, but it kind of looks like a combination of shear and bending. And so we've looked at this slide a few times where I've shown compression and tension, shear, bending. Now we have since learned that bending, if it is bending in this direction, causing compression in the top and tension in the bottom, we know that moment can be represented as a couple, something that is equal and opposite. So these are equal and opposite, and these are equal and opposite. And look at that. Up here at the top, we are showing two internal forces pointing towards the place we cut, or compression. And look at this, two arrows pointing away from the spot that we're cutting, or we learned last week that is showing an internal force that is a tension. Torsion looks similar to a combination of shear and moment. Look at that. We've got those same rotational air arrows shown as couples. So last week we looked at trusses. We saw that when we went through the calculations of some truss with loads applied to it where we figured out the reactions, if we cut right here, 
we found internal forces. We originally drew everything in tension because we didn't know what the internal forces were going to be. But we saw that if something was bending like this, we calculated that there was compression in the top. So look, I've redrawn this pointing this way. Tension in the bottom and some value in the webs here. So I've happened to draw it, draw it as tension, but don't worry about that right now. Well, we know that this one on the diagonal is a bit of a pain in the butt. We can redraw it as its x and y component. Well, we know that this, we've cut it right here, but we could have cut it right here. We could have made this cut almost as close to that as we possibly could. So essentially where this literally touches this. And we saw that if this was, um, um, if we were talking about moments, it was almost like it was passing along this line here. So let's just move this down here to that arrow. So we've added those up. So look at that. We've got, we've got forces going in the opposite direction from each other along the X plane. And we've got one left going on the Y plane. If we redraw this, let's just forget about all the junk in the middle of this. Let's just say this was one solid object that we cut along this plane. So same loads in the same spot, same reactions. We've now just treated this, let's color this in and make it solid, essentially. So it's the same internal forces, but look at these two. We know that we could redraw those as a moment. So if we cut a beam in bending using method of sections, we know that for this piece not to be flying off into space, there must be some internal moment and some internal shear holding it in place. So if we did method of sections on our truss and found all of the axial loads keeping this section from moving off into space because the hole wasn't moving in space, we can do the same with the beam. So for this portion of the beam not to move off into space, we know that the total must not be moving off into space, and that reaction was calculated to prove that. And then there must be internal forces that stop this portion from moving off into space. So let's go through what that might look like with this object. Now, sorry, again, still eating pretzels. So let's take a look at this beam right here. Where do we do our cuts? Well, we know first off, the very first thing we'll have to do is figure out our reactions. We want to know how this object as a whole doesn't fly off into space or spin away. Once we do that, we know we'll calculate what these reactions are, and then we need to know where to make our cuts. And that for you guys right now is probably the hardest choice. I am going to tell you, well, I told you that shear is essentially, we cut in a spot, we treat it like it's shifting past each other, um, and then we do it again here and again here and again here. So infinitely along this. But that's kind of boring for us and we'd be spending an eternity just designing this one beam. So what about we worry about the key spots and maybe a few others. So I'm gonna propose we cut just the tiniest little bit past the reaction, somewhere around the middle of here, somewhere around this load being applied. The question is, do I cut just before or just after? So maybe I'll do both. Somewhere around here and maybe just before my reaction. So we'll make those few cuts and see what information we come up with as we go through that process. But we know the very first thing we do is figure out what our reactions are. So let's make this bigger. So let's draw that beam.
What am I calling this? Am I calling this beam one? So we have, I have my beam. We've been told that there is a 20 kilonewton load on this. They've told us that this beam is 15 meters long and that this load is applied at 7.5 meters. It's extra fisheye lensy today, isn't it? I wonder if I can fiddle with this without messing it up too much. Ugh. I think I might even get a new camera for this. Okay, so here is the beam that we have, but we know that there must be something stopping this from flying off into space. We have reaction X, reaction 1, and reaction 2. And we want to figure out what reactions there are, what values those are, for this to be in static equilibrium. So we know that we have three handy equations that we can use to solve this. We can sum the forces in the x direction and see if everything is zero. Well, we only have Rx and no other loads, so Rx must be zero. We can sum the moments about the z-axis. And I'm going to be lazy and pick R1 as the point I spin it about. Rx passes through it. R1 passes through it. I'm left with my 20 kilonewtons and my R2 causing it to spin. So thumbtack right here, R20, or R20 kilonewton load trying to make it spin in that direction. My thumb is pointed into the page, that makes it negative. Minus 20 times 7.5 meters. And I've got I've got a thumbtack right here. R2 is trying to make it spin in that direction or the positive direction. And that's 15 meters. My camera is fuzzy. Uh, I can rearrange this and I solve for R2. Just looking at this, forgetting any math, what do you think the value of R1 and R2 is? It's right smack dab in the middle your gut should tell you 10 and 10. Well, let's take a look at this. Let's plug this into our calculator. We want to take this over here so it's positive. 20 times 7.5 is 150 divided by 15. Look at that. 10 kilonewtons. I'm going to use the bright light. Some are forces in the y direction, where upwards is positive. We have our unknown r1 in the positive direction. Our r2, which we solved to be 10, and our 20 kilonewtons. r1 equals 10 kilonewtons. So that lines up with what our gut told us it was going to be. So now we have our free body diagram with values. Let's put these in here. So now we're going to do method of sections. And so I said, where do we make our cuts? Well, I'm going to show you some fun ways to do that, but first, let's pick a few spots. I'm going to tell you that maybe, maybe an easy one to pick, let's pick right here. Let's cut halfway between R1 and our 20 kilonewton point load. So let's cut at 3.75 
meters. So let's make our first cut right there. So let's draw our partial free body diagram of that. We know that for this partial bit not to move, this 10 kilonewtons and this 0 kilonewtons were dependent on the 20 kilonewtons that was applied to it, but this thing needs to not move. So something must be keeping this in place. There is going to be an unknown shear and an unknown moment holding this in place. I am going to label them like this. Now, you're going to ask two things. Why the frack? Did she draw an arrow with half a head? And why did she draw it downwards? <sighs> well, I can tell you that I'm drawing it downwards because I've done this a bunch and I know that it's going to make it handy for me to draw it downwards. So, you could draw it upwards, it's totally fine. I'm going to tell you that positive and negative does not mean much in shear. A positive value versus a negative value does not change the meaning of the shear. The reason we track positive and negative shears is so that we can see where it crosses lines, where we hit zero. It's going to be apparent in a little bit what I'm talking about. The reason I draw my shear as downwards quite often, or negative, means I end up with a positive shear value very close to the beginning. Um, so that I have these two as equal and opposite, essentially. Um, you don't have to draw it downwards, you could draw it upwards, but I suggest you always be consistent. I have found that I like the pattern I get if I assume this is pointed downwards. Second question, why, is I, why have I drawn it as half of an arrowhead? Well, that is just habit. That is kind of a way of us showing that it is different from a reaction or an applied load that is an internal force because the other half of the arrowhead is over here. Feel free to draw the rest of that arrowhead. I, there is nothing wrong with drawing the full arrow to represent shear. This tends to be how people draw the shear internal force as an arrow. It is habit, and you will see that most people, if you looked up diagrams of this, if you went online and looked up more method of sections, which, hot tip, if you like to practice examples, I suggest you do that you will see that most other people will draw the arrowhead just like this. So these are unknown internal forces that must be holding this thing in place. If the object as a whole isn't moving, this little section that we cut can't be moving, so there must be some internal forces holding this tiny little piece in place. So now we can calculate using our same three equations what those are. This is the same thing we did when we were looking at our trusses. So let's go through and do exactly that. I'm not even going to bother with the x direction. We can see right here that the sum of the forces in the x direction is zero. Let's jump right to summing the forces in the y direction, where everything upwards is positive. We've got our 10 kilonewtons going upwards and then we've got our unknown shear force going downwards or in the negative direction. There's nothing else going up and down. So look at this now. If I bring this over here it's a minus 10. Minus V equals minus 10. Let's divide by negative 1. V equals 10 kilonewtons. So the internal shear force at this point on this beam is 10 kilonewtons. So there's an internal shear force of 10 kilonewtons on this. I'm sorry this is a little bit blurry, guys. Let's now try summing the moments about the z-axis 
where everything spinning in that direction is positive, equal to zero, what point should I pick to spin this about? Again, you can pick any point you want. I often find it easiest to get rid of one of the unknowns. As much as I've solved for shear here, maybe what I care about is the moment first. I often find it easiest when I'm doing method of sections to spin about the point I've cut. Or 3.75. I'm going to call that the 3.75 mark. God, what a pain in the butt. I'm going to I'm going to do something weird and see if my lens is dirty and my kids been playing with it. I don't even know how they would get it. It doesn't help that it's sunny today and it's a little bit um, glary. Okay, so I am going to pick this point right here to spin about, mostly because now V is passing right through it. And it makes means that my thumbtack is here. The distance of V to my thumbtack is zero, so I don't have to use it in my summing of my moments. So let's take a look. Thumbtack right here, I've got my 10 kilonewtons spinning it in this direction, or this direction, so minus 10. And my minus 10 is 3.75 meters away. And then I have my unknown moment, which is spinning in this direction about my thumbtack point right here, or plus m equals zero. I rearrange this, and m equals 10 times 3.75, or 37.5 kilonewton meters. I had kilonewtons and meters, so my moment is 3.75 kilonewton meters. Well, that's great. We have information. We have internal forces on this beam. If this was a factored load, this would be VF and MF, and we know that we need a beam that is strong enough or has a capacity greater than 10 kilonewtons of shear and 37.5 kilonewton meters of moment at that point right there. Now, we don't know if that's the worst values this beam C sees, so maybe we should make a few more cuts. Maybe we want to pick a few other spots to make a cut. This is where I'm going to blow your mind a little bit. Let's cut this at zero meters. And when I say zero meters, I am actually saying 0.0000000000000001 meters. So just the tiniest fraction of a bit past our 10 kilonewton reaction. So let's draw that. I am going to say that that distance there is actually zero meters. I have my 10 kilonewtons here, zero kilonewtons, and my unknown V and my unknown moment. So really, it's almost the exact same thing, except I am saying I am 0 0.0000000001 millimeters on this side of that reaction. So let's Sum the forces in the y direction with upwards being positive. We have plus 10 kilonewtons minus our unknown internal shear force equals zero. V equals 10 kilonewtons. Let's sum the moments about the z axes and everything in that direction is positive. And let's pick our point that we want to talk about. Well, it's essentially right here. It is zero. So shear is zero away from that point, so it doesn't cause it to spin. 
our 10 kilonewtons passes through it, or it's zero away, so it doesn't cause it to spin, we're left with m in the positive direction, or positive m, equals zero. We could have written it as 10 kilonewtons times zero uh, minus uh, v times zero, but that would have been zero, so we would have had everything be zero. So just past this point, we have 10 kilonewtons of shear and zero kilonewton meters of moment. Let's try another cut. Let's cut. I'm interested. I'm interested in what this. I'm interested in what this 20 kilonewtons does to the beam. But I don't know. Where do I cut? Do I cut right at it? Does that mean it's applied or isn't it? I'm going to propose two separate cuts. I'm going to do one each side of the 20 kilonewtons. The first one I'm going to do, I'm going to cut it at 7.5 meters. before the load is applied. So I guess technically it's 7.49999999999999 meters. You could go through and do the math that way. You could actually write out that we're, you know, 0.00000000001 before that applied load, if you preferred. And you would see that once we rounded things, we're pretty darn close to the values, we're, or we'd be exactly the values that I'm calculating here. So let's draw that so we're just before the load is applied. So we have 7.5 meters. We know for this not to be moving, this 10 kilonewtons must be here, but then there's nothing else being applied to this. So we have our unknown internal shear force and our unknown internal moment. We can do the same thing we've done in the previous two examples. Let's sum the forces in the y direction with everything upwards being positive. We've got 10 kilonewtons upwards, our unknown shear downwards, and that's it in the y direction, or V equals 10 kilonewtons. Let's spin our moment about the z axis where everything in this direction is positive, and we want to know what it takes for it to be in equilibrium. Let's do the same things I've done before. I'm going to spin it about this point right here, or at the 7.5 meter mark. So if I spin it about this point, shear passes right through it, or our unknown V. I guess we've actually calculated V is 10, but it passes right through it. To be a moment, you need a force and an eccentricity, and it has no eccentricity. Our zero passes through it, our 10 kilonewtons causes it to spin in this direction, or our negative direction. So minus 10 times our eccentricity, or our distance away, of 7.5 meters. And then we have our unknown moment causing it to spin in this direction, or plus m equals 0. If we rearrange this, m equals 75 kilonewton meters. All right, let's cut it now just on the other side of it. So let's make the same cut. Cut at 7.5 meters, but after. The load. So I guess technically we're cutting it at 
7.5000000000000001. So just like a fraction of a hair on the other side of our applied 20 kilonewton point load. Let's draw that partial free body diagram. We're still 7.5 meters away, but just. We know for this thing not to be moving, there's a 10 kilonewton reaction in that spot and a zero kilonewton reaction there. And we've got a replied 20 kilonewtons here. And for this thing not to be moving, there's an unknown internal shear and internal moment. Maybe they're zero, maybe they're not, but we don't know. So we have to assume that they're there and we can figure out maybe what those values are. So let's go through the same process we've done before. Let's sum the forces in the y direction with upwards being positive. We've got our 10 kilonewtons upwards. We've got our 20 kilonewtons downwards, so negative, and our unknown internal shear. Well, 10 minus 20 is minus 10. Bring it over here, it's plus 10, but it's minus V. Change our signs. V equals minus 10 kilonewtons. All of the ones before, V equaled 10 kilonewtons, 10 kilonewtons, 10 kilonewtons. And now we equal minus 10 kilonewtons. So it looks right at this point, right at this cut of 7.5 meters, we went from 10 kilonewtons of shear to minus 10 kilonewtons of shear. Interesting. Now, Let's sum the moments about this point here. So everything spinning in this direction is positive. I'm going to spin it about the z-axis. And let's make the cut at our 7.5 meter mark. So we have our 20 kilonewtons passing through that load and our V passing through that load. So we're left with 10 kilonewtons spinning it in that direction or minus 10 times 7.5. The 20 kilonewtons, well, we could say it's spinning it, but it has zero eccentricity. Our V has zero eccentricity, and our unknown moment is spinning it in that direction, or plus M equals zero. We rearrange this, and M equals 75 kilonewton meters. Okay, so now we've made the cut right there. We still don't have a full picture of this. I'm going to say, let's cut it here and here. So some halfway in between our 20 kilonewtons in our reaction, and then just before our second reaction. Let's make those last two cuts, and then maybe we'll have a little bit of information we can start to play with. So let's cut at 11 point, where are we cutting? 11.25. So let's cut at 11.25 now. We know that there is a 20 kilonewton point load at 7.5 meters here. And we're cutting this at 11.25 meters. And for this not to be moving, there is a 10 kilonewton reaction here zero kilonewton reaction there. 
This thing can't be moving in space because its total object isn't moving in space. So there could be internal unknown forces here. So our unknown shear and our unknown internal moment. Let's sum our forces in our y direction, where everything upwards is positive. We've got 10 kilonewtons upwards, 20 kilonewtons downwards, and we've got our unknown shear downwards. We rearrange this, and V equals minus 10 kilonewtons. Okay, let's sum the moments with everything in that direction being positive about the z-axis. And again, I like to pick the point I've cut at. So I'm picking 11.25. I'm putting my imaginary thumbtack right here. So we have 10 kilonewtons trying to spin it in that direction, or 10 times 11.25. We've got 20 kilonewtons trying to spin it in that direction, which is, sorry, our 10 kilonewtons is a negative here, so that was supposed to be minus 11, 10 times 11.25. Our 20 kilonewtons is trying to spin it in the positive direction and its distance away is this, or 11.25 minus 7.5, or 11.25 minus 7.5, or 3.75 meters. And then we have our unknown moment in the positive direction, spinning it in the positive direction. So let's work this out. Let's see what this comes out to. We've got minus 10 times 11.25 plus 20 times 3.75 or minus 37.5 but we need to bring it over to the other side here. M equals 37.5 kilonewton meters. Okay, we have one more cut we wanted to make. We also wanted to make the cut just before our reaction here, or just before R2. So let's cut at 15 meters before reaction R2. So technically 14.9999999999999999 meters. So we have this as 15 meters long. We have 20 kilonewtons applied to it like that at 7.5 meters from this end. We know that for this object not to be moving in space, our reaction is 10 kilonewtons and 0 kilonewtons. And we have some unknown internal forces that are stopping this section from moving. So we can do the same thing we've been doing, sum the forces in the y direction with upwards being positive. We've got plus 10 kilonewtons minus 20 kilonewtons, minus V. We rearrange this and we get V equals minus 10 kilonewtons.
Let's sum the moments about the z-axis where everything in that direction is positive. And we're doing it at our 15 meter mark. We have, if we're putting our thumbtack right here, we have 10 kilonewtons trying to spin it in this direction or this direction. My fingers curl in the direction it's spinning. My thumb is pointing into the page. I got that band -aid. It's driving me nuts. Um, spinning it in that direction, so my thumb is into the page or minus 10 kilonewtons times 15 meters, because we're 15 meters away. We've got 20 kilonewtons trying to spin it in this direction, or the direction I've said is positive. So plus 20 kilonewtons times, well, it is this distance away. We had 15 minus 7.5. I'm actually just going to 15 minus 7.5. And then our V passes through the point. There's no eccentricity. We have our unknown moment, which is in the positive direction. We can rearrange this, or we can solve this. And M equals negative 10 times 15 plus 20 times 15 minus 7.5 equals 0. Huh. So no moment there. Interesting. Well, we now have some interesting information. Let's maybe, just to see if it could help us in some way, draw this out. Let's see what happens if we draw this out for ourselves. We had a beam that looked something like this. And let's talk about shear. Um, we had at x equals 0 meters, sorry, at x equals 0 meters, our shear equaled 10 kilonewtons. So that was this one right here. We calculated 10 kilonewtons. At x equals 3.75 meters, which was the very first one we did, we calculated 10 kilonewtons. At 7.5 meters just before the load, we had 10 kilonewtons. Then we did a second 7.5 meters and we got minus 10 kilonewtons. And then we did 11.25 meters and we got minus 10 kilonewtons. So that was this one right here. We got minus 10 kilonewtons at 11.25. And at 15 meters, we calculated minus 10 kilonewtons. Let's just see what that looks like. At zero, we had 10 kilonewtons. At 3.75, we had 10 kilonewtons. At 7.5, we had 10 kilonewtons, but we also had minus 10 kilonewtons. At 11.25, we had minus 10 kilonewtons. And at 15, we had minus 10 kilonewtons. This is a diagram of what the shear value was everywhere along the length of this beam. Well, look at this. So this was 10 kilonewtons, and this is 10 kilonewtons. Do you notice I'm not writing the negative anymore? The only reason the negative is important is because it helps me track how it goes up and down regular, relative to this. But I don't really care in the end if it's positive or negative. I need to know to draw this diagram. But the value being positive or negative is totally irrelevant to me. So we had 10 kilonewtons and minus 10 kilonewtons. So it looks like V max, or V max, is 10 kilonewtons. 
Whether it's positive or negative is irrelevant. It looks like the value is 10 kilonewtons. And here's the thing. This is a shear force diagram. It is a handy little diagram that at a glance lets me see what my shear force is anywhere on my beam. Interestingly enough, let's come back and look at our original free body diagram. We had 10 kilonewtons of a reaction and we went up. Nothing happened and we went along until we had 20 kilonewtons of downward load or 10, 20 kilonewtons. And then we went along with nothing happening until we had 10 kilonewtons of upward load applied again. So this shear diagram seems to very much be related to exactly what loads are being applied to our object. Let's try drawing a diagram of a moment. Let's write out our moment here. So at x, so at x, and let's just write it in meters. Our moment is going to equal what in kilonewton meters? Well, at zero meters, we had zero moment. So at zero, we had zero. At 3.75 meters, we had 37.5 kilonewton meters. At 7.5 meters, just before the cut, or just before the load, we had 75 meter, kilonewton meters. And then again at 7.5 meters, we had 75 kilonewton meters. At 11.25 meters, we come over here, we have 37.5 kilonewton meters. And at 15 meters, we have zero. Let's try plotting that out. We have zero, and then we had 37.5, seven, 75, and 75, 37.5, and zero again. This looks like a nice little diagram that tells us what the moment is anywhere along our beam. And look at this. M max equals 75 kilonewton meters, and it is at the middle of the beam, or at at 7.5, or the midpoint. And this was at 0 and 15 meters. So we can see now, at a glance, kind of what's happening with the internal forces on this beam. It would certainly be a lot easier if we didn't have to know what all the values were for everything every time we did this. What if we did it using placeholders. What if we didn't know what that load was and what that dimension was, but we did know what was a point load applied at the center of a beam? I said this lecture is example heavy. I'm gonna stretch my hands, take a drink of water. And eat another pretzel. Okay. Oh, I swallowed that water like it was a lump. Okay. Let's go through the exact same process, but what if we don't know what that load is? So beam one. No values. So we're going to draw the same beam, but we don't know what the loads are or the dimensions are on it. You're probably thinking, why the frig would you make us do that? Well, 
you're gonna see that it starts to be kind of handy if we can just fill things in later. So, we have a beam of unknown length L, and we're gonna have a load applied to it at one half L. Applied load of P, and we have unknown reactions R1 and unknown reactions R2. And I'm just, I'm putting zero here. I'm not going to go through that step of summing the forces in the x direction. We know now that that's zero. Well, we know that the very first thing we have to do is figure out what R1 and R2 is. Now, intuitively, you knew when that was 20 kilonewtons that 10 went here and 10 went here. What you actually intuitively knew is that if something was in the middle of this, half of the load went to each side. So if we go through and do this, I think that we would find that our reaction should be half of P at each end. Let's go through and see if that actually works out the way we expect it to. Let's sum the forces well, let's sum the forces in the x direction, just to be thorough. This could have been our x. Our x equals zero. Okay, so I've written it out, just to be thorough. Let's now sum the moments with everything in that direction being positive, but the z-axis and let's pick R1. So I'm putting my thumbtack right here. I have P trying to spin it in that direction, or what I call the negative direction. So minus P times the distance it is away from the spot I'm trying to spin about, or 1 half L. I've got R2 trying to spin it in that direction. Put my thumbtack right there. My fingers are curling in that direction. Or plus R2. And R2 is L away. There's nothing else causing it to spin. We want to know what this, this is in terms of R2. So let's rearrange this. We've got minus one half PL, we can bring it over to the other side. Um, our two L equals positive one half PL. Well, we've got L on both sides. Let's divide L through. We end up with R two equals one half P. We thought that half of the load should go to each side we see that that actually is the case. Or at least we're assuming it's the case for R1, but R2 equals 1 half P. Let's sum the forces in the Y direction now, for everything upwards being positive. We've got our unknown R1 going upwards. We've got P going downwards. And we've got R2 going upwards, but we know that R2 is one half p. One p or negative p plus one half p is negative one half p, bringing it over to the other side. R1 equals one half p. So it looks like we know these values now. This is something we intuitively knew. Half of if you put a point load at the middle of something, half of it is going to go to each side. That is something you intuitively know. We've just proven it mathematically here. Let's go through and make those cuts like we did last time. Well, 
I could cut right here and right here and right here, but I prefer to just cut somewhere along here, whether it's zero or all the way to half L. I am going to cut, I'm going to cut at x equals zero to one half L. So I'm going to cut at some unknown spot x along here. So I'm cutting somewhere in here and I don't know where it is. I just know it's somewhere between zero and one half L. So this is my dimension x. I know for this part that I am part, um, partial free body diagram that this is one half p and this is zero and that there is some internal force that I don't know what it is that must be keeping this in place an unknown shear and an unknown moment so this looks exactly like all of those sections that we cut in between zero and p we just happened to pick what x was. We picked one where x was 0, we picked one where x was 3.75, and we picked one where x was 7.5. But we're using an unknown placeholder x here now. So let's sum the forces in the y direction, where everything upwards is positive. We have our 1 half p going upwards, and we have our unknown v going downwards. We can rearrange this and v equals one half p kilonewtons. Let's assume that p was in kilonewtons up here and that l was in fact in meters. So Anywhere between 0 and 1 half L, V equals 1 half P. So anywhere in this zone, the shear is half of our applied load. Let's sum the moments about the z-axis, everything in that direction being positive, Let's take a look. Well, I said I always like to put my thumbtack right here. It gets rid of the shear for me. It makes life a little bit easier. So I'm going to put my imaginary thumbtack right here. Shear passes through that point. So I have this 1 half P trying to spin it in that direction. Curl my hands in that direction. My thumb's pointing into the page. So it is minus one half p times some distance x because it is x away from that cut. Shear passes through it, moment's trying to spin it in that direction in my unknown moment. Curl my hands like that, plus moment equals zero. I can rearrange this and m equals one half px kilonewtons. So if I know where I am between zero and one half L, I can calculate my moment dependent on x. We'll go through, we'll, we'll put some numbers to that, we'll check that out in a minute. Let's make another cut on the other side here. So somewhere between one half L and L. where x equals 1 half L to L. So we're going to cut anywhere in here, anywhere after something interesting happens. Let's draw our partial free body diagram. This is x. 
we know we have our reaction here of one half P. And we know that at the midpoint of this, or at half L, we had our point load P applied. And that this distance was one half L. This thing isn't moving in space because we've determined what reactions it takes for it not to spin in space. So this partial free body diagram also can't spin in space. So there must be internal forces holding it in place. Our unknown shear and our unknown moment. Let's sum the forces in the y direction. We have our one half x going upwards, or our one half p going upwards. We have our applied load p going downwards, or minus p. And we have our unknown shear going downwards, or minus v. If we look at this, we've got half of p minus p, leaving us with negative one half p. We bring v over to the other side. V equals minus one half P. Let's sum our moments about the Z axis. Oh, I forgot to write that, that was at point X. But the Z axis, and I'm going to pick this point right here, X, or where I made the cut, or X away from my first reaction. So I'm putting my thumbtack right here. I've got my one half P that's spinning it in this direction. If I take my right hand, you can see that my thumb is pointing into the page. So it's minus one half P times X. And then I've got P, this is my thumbtack, P is spinning it in that direction, or the positive direction, so plus P, but P is some unknown distance away from my cut X. Or, but I know it's this far away at this end, one half L. So this distance here is X minus one half L. So P is times X minus one half L. This is the exact same thing we did when we knew what the numbers were. It just starts to look messy because I'm using placeholders here. And then we still have M spinning it in that direction, or our positive M equals zero. Let's rearrange this. Let's break this up a little bit. So I'm going to write it out a bit slower here. So this is minus p one half px or minus one half px plus px minus one half pl. So I've multiplied p times both of these plus m equals zero. Well, I've got minus one half x plus sorry, one, minus one half px plus px is going to leave us with plus one half px minus one half pl plus m equals zero. Let's bring these over to the other side. m equals one half pl minus one half Px we can well let's let's leave it like that. So we've got m equals one half pl minus one half px kilonewton meters.
oh, that's it. We only needed to make two cuts. It covers all our bases. Let's see what information that gives us. Let's write ourselves a little summary. We have those two equations that we had, and I want to see what we get. Let's Let's write a little summary here. Um, at x equals 0 to 1 half L, v equals 1 half P, and moment equals 1 half Px. At x equals one half L to L, V we calculated equaled negative one half P, and M equaled one half PL minus one half PX. So let's plug some of those in. Let's see. So at what happens at x equals 0? So if we put 0 into this equation, so it's between 0 and 1 half L, well, it doesn't seem to make a difference. V equals 1 half P. M equals x equals 0. All of that goes to 0. At x equals, uh, let's do a quarter L. Or right here, one quarter of our length. So one quarter L. If we put, uh, if the equation for V is one half P, well, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Well, for x equals one quarter L, we have one half times one quarter equals one eighth. M equals one eighth PL. At X equals one half L. Well, look, we have one half L twice. Let's do this one first. Uh, v still equals one half P. It's independent of X. M, if we plug one half L into here, we have one half and one half. 1 quarter, so we end up with 1 quarter PL. I'm going to do 1 half L again, but now I'm going to do it on this bottom line here. V now equals minus 1 half P. And M equals, so for X we're plugging in 1 half L. So minus one half p times one half l equals minus one quarter l. We had one half pl minus one quarter pl leaves us with one quarter pl. So it didn't matter which side of that load we were on, our moment stays the same. At x equals three quarter l, we plug it into here. Well, there's no place for x in here. V equals minus one half p. And m equals, we have one half pl minus three eighths pl. Um, if you sum those up, we still end up with one eighth pl. And at uh, x equals L. Again, V seems to be independent of where it is on the beam, only dependent on what side of the applied load it is. At uh, x equals L, we have 1 half PL minus 1 half PL, or 0. So let's plot what that might look like.
Let's draw our shear diagram. Um, one half p at x equals zero. At x equals a quarter, we had one half p. And at half of l, we had one half p. And then we have a direct shift down to minus one half l. And then those stayed the same. One half p and one half p. And so it looks like v max equals one half p everywhere. Didn't matter where it was on it, whether it was positive or negative, v max is one half p. Let's do our bending moment diagram. So we have a bending moment diagram we're going to draw now. Um, at x equals 0, moment equals 0, and at L it equals 0. Then 1 eighth, 1 quarter, 1 quarter, 1 eighth as we went along. So, one eighth, one quarter, one eighth again, or one quarter, and one eighth. And this is one quarter PL, and M max seemed to equal one quarter PL. At midpoint. So it looks like we didn't need to know the exact values to figure this out and now if we knew what our force was, well let's say we had an example where we had P equals 20 and L equals 15 Vmax equals one half p or ten kilonewtons. P equals twenty kilonewtons and L equals fifteen meters. M max equals one quarter times twenty times fifteen equals point two five times twenty times 15 equals 75 kilonewton meters. In the end, this one was a lot fewer calculations than this one. So sometimes doing it this way with placeholders, as much as it seems like it's harder, might be the easier one. Plus now, now I don't have to go back and redo it. Every time I have a new set of values and forces, or new force and a new length, this now works no matter what the length and force are. As long as it's a point load applied at the middle, I know what my maximum shear and my maximum moment are. And I know what the diagram looks like to show it anywhere along its length. So here that is all worked out both ways. So I've talked about kind of the decks and things applying uniformly distributed loads. So remember when we look at a plan and we see a deck or joists kind of close together applying a load to something we have just the tributary width loading it up and we keep it as a line load on it. Or essentially saying that for every, kilon every meter of length, we have that many kilonewtons of load being applied to it. If 
we were looking at our free body diagrams when we were finding our reactions, we would pretend that it was a point load somewhere along its length. If it was the full length of the beam, we put it in the middle because, because we intuitively understood what an analogous point load was. So if I was standing in the middle of a beam, you knew that one half of my load went to one end and one half of my load went to the other for figuring out the reactions. If you took me and spread me evenly all over the table, so every little bit of me was everywhere on the table, you would know that one half of my load would go to one end and one half of my load would go to the other. That for the reactions, that didn't change. And that is intuitively understanding what an analogous point load is. The thing about an analogous point load is we can use it on our partial free body diagrams, but we have to pay attention to the portion of the free of the uh, of the uniformly distributed load that we're talking about, or the distributed load in some way. So if this was our full free body diagram, our load that represents this, or our point load that we might use to represent this, we wouldn't draw it in the middle of the beam. We know that the load would actually be at the centroid of this, or at the halfway point of this load. So it wouldn't be at the middle of the beam, it would be at the middle of the length of this distributed load. So if we had a distributed load along this beam, W, when we were trying to find the reactions, we could represent it as an analogous point load, P equals W times D, and it would act at the middle of D. If we had a triangularly distributed load, we know that the analogous point load that represents this would happen at the centroid of the triangle. Well, we know a centroid of the triangle happens two-thirds over this way or one-third over this way. And it is the amount of that triangle, or W times D2, which would give us the full rectangle, divided by 2. Or P equals W times D2 divided by 2, and it is happening at two-thirds of D2. But we had some amount D1 here kind of left over. So the analogous point load that we would use to solve for the reactions of this free body diagram would look like this. This is not the free body diagram. This is. And when I ask you to draw the free body diagram of something with a uniformly distributed load on it or a distributed load, this is what I'm looking for. When you need to solve for the reactions, you can draw this to help you find the information you need. So now let's take a look at a uniformly distributed load acting on a pin roller beam. So there is some even amount of load coming in on this beam. Maybe there's joists really often, or maybe it's picking up deck and it's a purlin, but it has some load coming in on it everywhere along its length. And so for every meter of length of it, there are W kilonewtons of load being applied to this. Uh, and we want to know what the internal shear and what the internal moment are anywhere on this beam. So that is our next challenge. Okay. So let's do beam two. Let's make me big here again. All right, so beam two.
I have to keep an eye on the time. I have a lot I want to share with you guys, and I have to pay attention to when the babysitter is leaving. Um, okay, so we're going to do the same thing, but with no values. We're not the same thing. We're not even going to try it with values. I have so much faith in you guys, we're going to jump right into no values for this bad boy. So we have an applied load of W, and W is in kilonewtons per meter, and our beam is an unknown length L. We have Rx and R1 and R2 that are ensuring this thing can't move up and down and back and forth or spin because these must be acting as a couple to prevent it from spinning. So there is our free body diagram. This is the free body diagram of this object. We want to find the reactions. So let's find the reactions. And finding the reactions, we can use an analogous point load. This is not the free body diagram. Using analogous point load. So remember, this is only to help us find the reactions because we know that this can be represented as, did I draw this uneven? Well, that's going to be annoying. As a point load acting at the centroid of this, just as kind of a placeholder to help us find our reactions. So our x and our 1 and our 2. I'm just going to write that Rx equals 0. I feel like we've done this enough. Or our, our point load here is our length times our load. So we have kilonewtons per meter and we have L meters. So our total kilonewtons are our, is our W kilonewton meters times our L meters or W times L. So P equals W times L, and it is going to act at one half L, and this is L. We can start to solve for things here. Let's sum the moments. Everything spinning in that direction being positive, about the z-axis. And I'm going to pick R1, because I'm lazy and I always do the same thing. I'm going to put my thumbtack right here, and I'm going to curl my fingers in this direction, representing my P spinning in that direction, so the negative direction, so minus... WL times one half L. So that's the moment due to P. And then we have R2 spinning it in that direction, curling my fingers in that direction there, or plus R2 equals zero. Oh, nope, sorry. Plus R2 times L equals zero. So we have uh, one half we have one half minus one half W L squared plus R2 times L. We bring this over, it would be positive. We've got L on both sides. We end up with R2 equals 
1 half WL. Let's sum the forces in the y direction with upwards being positive. We have R1 going upwards, we've got P going downwards, or minus WL going downwards, plus R2 going upwards, which we found is 1 half WL equals 0. Uh, well, that gives us minus 1 half WL here, bring it over, 1 equals, or R1 equals 1 half WL kilonewtons. Well, if I was smeared everywhere on the table, you know that it was me smeared everywhere over the table, added back up into one glob, and then split to each end to be the reactions. So it seems like it should still make sense here. Now, the thing is, we want to know what the internal loads are. So we have reactions now. Let's, let's plug those in here. We have um, R1 equals 1 half WL and R2 equals 1 half WL. So it equals, well, let's come back up here, it equals 1 half WL and equals 1 half WL. So we found some things now. But we want to know the internal, we want to know the internal forces anywhere on this beam. So let's make some unknown cut. It looks like something is happening everywhere, but it looks like it's consistently happening. So let's make some unknown cut somewhere along L here. So cut from x equals 0 to L. So I'm going to cut somewhere along here. We know that we've already figured out what our reaction is. It is 1 half WL and 0. And we have an applied load of W on this. And we are cutting this at some place we don't know where we're cutting it along here, but somewhere along here. And we have internal loads that we don't know what they are, but they, we have an unknown shear and an unknown moment that are stopping this thing from moving in space. So this is our partial free body diagram. We need to draw the analogous point load of our partial free body diagram. So we have some distance x with this load on it now that we want to draw. So we did have that load, but we're going to draw our analogous point load, which is going to be w times x. So W times our distance X. So before we had a full length, so it was W times L. But we only have this partial length, so it's W times our partial length, X. This load is being applied at 1 half X. We have our reaction of 1 half WL and our unknown shear and moment that stop this thing from moving in space. Let's sum our forces in our Y direction. So if we sum everything for this in the up and down direction, we have 1 half WL going upwards. We have minus WX going downwards. 
and we have our unknown shear going downwards, or minus v equals zero. We want to know what v equals, so we can bring v over to the other side. v equals one half wl minus wx. So w is the applied load, l is the total length, w still the applied load, and x is wherever we're cutting. Let's sum the moments about the z-axis. And remember, I always like to sum this about x, or this point right here. Okay, we have, so if we're summing this about this point right here, our reaction is trying to spin it in this direction. If I curl my fingers in that direction, it's in the negative direction. So minus one half WL times X. We have WX trying to spin it in this direction or the positive direction. So plus WX, let's use the dots to represent multiplication, times, so WX times, well this here is also one half X. V passes right through the low, or the point we're trying to spin about, and then we have a moment trying to spin it in the positive direction. Okay, so we've got minus one half x times x plus wx times one half x. Let's bring this over and this over. So we've got, I'm just going to rewrite this minus one half wl times x, oh, sorry that would be plus minus wx times one half x. Uh, this is one half wl x minus one half wx squared. Perfect. So, anywhere along this, we have V equals one half WL minus WX, and M equals one half WLX minus one half WX squared kilonewton meters. I know, I know, that looks horrible and messy, and you're all going, I hate you, Shannon. Why are you doing this to us? Why are you making us do this math? But you're going to see that when we start to plug some numbers in, it's going to look just a teeny tiny little bit better. Or hopefully you think that. Let's take a look at a few spots along a beam. So let's work out a few points. So we have X and we have V and we have M. So this is in meters, this is in kilonewtons, and that's in kilonewton meters. So we know that at X equals X, V equals one half WL minus WX, and M equaled one half WLX minus one-half wx squared. So let's take a look at x equals zero. Well, at x equals zero, uh, we're going to have one-half wl minus zero, or one-half wl. At x equals zero, we have an x here and an x here. 
that all goes away, moment equals zero. Let's take a look at one half L. If I was being thorough, I would go through and plug in, I would do one quarter L as well. You feel free to do that as an activity. I have done it. I think I actually maybe even have it in the slides possibly, or maybe I deleted that. But you're gonna see, you're gonna see the important bits in a second. So one half L, so let's plug it in. One half WL minus W one half L. Huh. Zero. Shear equals zero. One half L of uh, plugged into or for X plugged into one half W L X. Well, that would be one half W L squared times half is a quarter minus one half W uh, one half squared times L squared we go through and actually work that out, it's WL squared divided by 8. And if we plug L in, we plug L into here, we have 1 half WL minus WL. We end up with minus 1 half WL. And if we plug L in here, and L in here, we have 1 half WL squared minus 1 half WL squared, or zero. Now, if we went through and plugged in a quarter and three quarters, you would see that our, so let's draw, let's redraw our free body diagram, just so I can be thorough. This is our free body diagram, where that is W, and that is L. And that is our 1, and that is our 2, and that equals 0. We went through and we found that R1 equaled R2 equaled WL divided by 2, or 1 half WL. We can plug in our shear, and we get, sorry, plug in our shear, and we get 1 half WL, we get 0 at the midpoint, and we get 1 half WL. Remember, the negative is almost inconsequential. If we plugged in 1 quarter L, we would find that we get 1 quarter WL. And at 3 quarters L, we would get minus 1 quarter WL. So this is the free body diagram. This is the shear diagram. And we have Vmax equals WL divided by 2 at ends, and it's the same and V equals zero at midpoint. So that seems like an interesting thing to know. Let's take a look at our moment diagram as well. Well, we know it was zero at the ends and at the midpoint it was WL squared divided by 8. If we plugged in at a quarter and three quarters, we would see that it's actually the lines for a parabolic curve, which makes sense because we had a squared in our equation there. But the really big thing to take away here is that M max equals 
WL squared divided by 8 at midpoint. M equals 0 at ends. So if I told you that the most common beam type that we ever designed was a uniformly distributed load on a pin roller support, you then know that for that type of beam, it doesn't matter what the load is and it doesn't matter what the length is, you know you can calculate the reactions, you know you can calculate the maximum shear and where it is, you know you can calculate the maximum moment and where it is, and you also know where shear and moment equal zero. And so that seems like a really handy piece of information to have. So let's come back to the lecture slides here. So we have that all worked out. So using method of sections, we developed equations that find the reactions, the shear, and the moment at any point on the simply supported beam, as well as the maximums. Those two equations are ones you should know. You should know that the maximum shear is WL divided by 2, and you should know the maximum moment is WL squared divided by 8 for a uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam. But that is the majority of the beams we analyze. So you have the majority of the information that we do again and again and again and again and again right there. In fact, we've done it so much that look at this. Beam formula. Uniformly distributed load. Look at this. X, L, W, L. There is our reaction and our reaction. R equals V equals W, L divided by 2. And look at this. 1 half WL minus WX, that's exactly what we calculated, X being at any point, or V being at any point, X along the beam. Moment, max at the center, WL squared divided by 8. We calculated this ourselves, and the reason that's important is so that you can see that all of the other ones that are here, you can actually manually calculate yourself. It's just that they are done so much that we have tables that help us out a little bit. Look at the other thing here. Delta max at center. Well, delta is the symbol for deflection. Look, 5 times WL squared divided by 384E. Well, we know that E is um, a property of... Actually, you don't know that. Never mind. I'm getting my courses confused. See this here? We're going to talk an awful lot about that next term. This is all going to come clear to you at the end of next term. So far at the end of this term, you only know how to calculate what the maximum deflection you're allowed to have is. This helps us calculate what the actual deflection is. And we're going to spend a lot of time learning that next term. But look at this one. Look, 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 we did this one already. Uh, M max at the point load. Um, P, L divided by 4. We calculated that. R equals shear equals P divided by 2. We calculated those already manually ourselves. So there are more of them up on the uh, um, Quercus for you so that you can take a look at those. Um, well, maybe they're not. I should go make sure that you have those. So, um, I want to make sure I upload those for you. I'm going to leave myself a note. Upload. View diagrams. Okay, so I'll put that in the downloads module, but also in the lecture module for this. But it means that you have all of them. We're going to go through um, another example or two, I think. And I've picked ones that let us do it manually, but then also that we can verify it against 
um, some of these bean formula. Some of them are annoying, um, like here, they've put W here, uh, but W, they're talking about the analogous point load. So they've said W, so I've added this note for you, W is the analogous point load, so that's really the maximum W that would be right here, which is the value of that triangle. So W times L divided by 2, acting at the 2 thirds point on that element. Actually, so it's acting here, but it's not necessarily where the maximum load is. Here's one increasing to a point at the middle. Again, they've used W as the analogous point load, but you can figure out what that is. Uh, a point load anywhere on the beam. Two equal concentrated point loads. And here's one with a cantilever with a uniformly distributed load on it. Look at that, look at that diagram. It starts to get really cool and interesting there, doesn't it? And look at that moment diagram. The moment diagram looks like it crosses over as well. Um, so let's do one here. Do I do this? Let me see how I do it in the notes. Well, you know what? I'm not going to go through and do this one using method of sections. Um, mostly be, well, you know what, this one's worked out for you guys to do using method of sections. You can follow along in the example notes. I'm not going to do that one live for you, mostly because I don't think you're going to gain much from it. Um, but we do know that we should be able to do that looking at those equations we already developed. We know that the reaction should be uh, WL divided by 2, or 20 times 6 divided by 2, or 20 times 6 divided by 2, 60. We know that the shear should be the worst case here, 0 here, and worst case here, and it should equal what the reaction value were, or it was, or 60 kilonewtons. We also know that the moment should be WL squared divided by 8, or 20 times L squared divided by 8. 20 times 6 squared divided by 8, 90 kilonewton meters. Let's take a look. If we went through and did this, we would see that, yes, 60 kilonewtons at each end and 90 kilonewton meters at the midpoint. So if you want some practice, go through and do this one using method of sections and cut it just before the reaction or just after the reaction, at a quarter, at a half, at three quarters, and just before R2. Um, and see if you get a, um, a, a shear diagram and a moment diagram that looks like that. Um, just want to see how many I, I do with you guys. Um, I want to leave some for you to try to do that you follow along with. Okay. So I'm going to do one more with you guys. I'm going to do beam four, which is a, a beam with a point load not at the center. So somewhere over here. We've actually got a very explicit one, but I find it a bit better to ignore what the actual values are. So I'm going to do it actually using placeholders instead. Actually, no, I don't do that. Well, well that's a total pain in the behind, isn't it? Um, you know what? I don't know. I don't think you guys need me to, to manually do these again. You have them worked out here. And it's pretty thorough. It's just me talking a lot, which as much as I like to hear the sound of my own voice, you guys might not enjoy it quite as much. Um, you can do it using placeholders or you can do it using numbers, and then you can go through and check what it looks like using the beam loading diagrams. So this one was a point load not at the center, and you guys had that example right here. So a concentrated point load at any point. Um, so you can go through and do that manually as a check if you like more examples to work with. And then you can cross-check it with what this tells you. Um, uh, so it actually tells you 
where these would be as well. Um, and then there is a uniformly distributed load with a backspan and a cantilever with values here. And that one is also in this. Here's this one right here. Um, where you can go through and pick at various points using um, method of sections that I taught you. So you have all of those worked out right here, step by step, where first we solve for the reaction, and then we solve for the analogous point load for the full free body diagram to get those reactions. Then we make cuts along its length using the numbers. It looks like what I did with this one is I did a cut X but I used the actual numbers just to make my life a little bit easier. So X was the only placeholder I used. So I did a cut from R1 to R2, and then I did a, a, a cut from R2 to the end, and I figured out my equations, and then I went through and solved for my shear diagram and my bending moment diagram. So if you are a person who likes to practice, these are worked out here for you to practice with. Your assignment is the same thing. There's more worked out examples for you. They might even be the same ones that, now that I'm trying to remember it. Um, but here are some forever tips. Shear tends to be the worst at the ends. Not always, but usually. Moment tends to be the worst at the middle or where we have a high load applied. You should know how to do method of sections on a beam. You should know how to do method of sections on a beam with no numbers. You should understand that analogous point loads are not the free body diagram. You should be able to draw a shear and bending moment diagram. Don't forget the labels and units, they're super handy. You should be able to determine the worst shear and the worst moment from those diagrams. And you should be able to cross check the shear diagram, the bending moment diagram, VF and MF with the beam loading tables that I am going to make sure I have uploaded for you right now. So, I know it's a lot of information, but it's mostly just about being methodical. I've given you a bunch of examples that you can work through. If you still don't like that, if you still need more examples, Google it. There are going to be a gazillion of them. They're all going to be very similar takes on the ones I've done. Um, I remember doing it when I was in school, and it is just, well, we did some really complex, annoying ones. But most of the ones you guys are going to be ever worried about are going to be a uniformly distributed load on a pin roller condition, which we've already covered. But you should have a feel for it. But don't, don't kill yourself on this. You have to go through the assignment, take a look at it. And you should understand where these things are coming from. But I, I know you guys aren't math majors. I don't expect you guys to be able to memorize how to do these things. But you should have an appreciation of what's going on here. Okay, next week is kind of a fun one. It's kind of a low-key one. So uh, see you next week, team.